do you, so in conclusion, why am I wearing this outfit? You're asking me why you're wearing that outfit? Yeah. I'm trying to be Morpheus. Oh, oh, okay. D um, did more do you know? So, do you know, Neo? Do you know what the Matrix is? Yeah. You turned me on to that movie. Did I? I remember this specifically. This, yes, you turned me on to the movie. It was probably about six months after it came out. Uh, and uh, I remember you called me out of the blue and you said, have you seen this movie? And I'm like, no, Keanu Reeves, like seriously. Why would I go see that? Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Like I loved Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, but I mean, he's gonna ruin it. And you're like, no, it's good in spite of him. And he's good in it. And it's it's right up your alley. And, and you know, and it was like, oh yeah, it was right up my alley. <laughs> yeah, well, and now it, it, to the point that uh, there are some serious physicists, not a lot, uh, who believe we're living in a simulation right now. So yeah, that comes up a lot. Who knows? But it, it's like string theory. It's untestable. There's there's no way to know. Therefore, it's not really science. So I like these ideas. I, I'm I'm always fascinated by these ideas. Uh, I like to occasionally can't overdose on them, but I like to read uh, every every year. I like to read at least one big idea book. And I'm already over my quotient. I've read two big idea books uh, this year, um, and. Um, it reminds me of one that I read a few years ago. It's a wintertime book when it's February, not a lot going on, dark and cold. And it's uh, called, uh, Why Is There Something Rather Than Nothing? Hmm. Right? It's, it's this classic philosophical question that the universe exists, but it's equally plausible, a, a completely equally plausible outcome that the universe might have been filled with nothing. Or that if, if it was empty space, it's possible that it might not have existed at all. So why this rather than that? So there's a whole book about this because this is a, I really wanted to read this book. That's what a fantastic question. I love these sorts of questions. So he interviews a, a panoply of, of uh, disciplines, uh, physicists, philosophers, priests, Buddhists, uh, everybody. And I came away extremely disappointed because yeah. uh, basically uh, uh, no from a scientific answer. perspective, nothing can ever be known. Uh, it's beyond questioning. And the religious uh, people gave a bunch of baloney answers yeah. like uh, yeah. good, things like goodness requires that the universe come into existence. Well, that's, that, yeah. that, that, that's, that's playing games with language. So I find, I find those, those things very unsatisfactory. Well, uh, that's interesting. Because you know, concepts of good and evil are not, they're not constants of the universe. They're not physical quantities. Right. Uh, they're, they're inventions that we've created in order to, to maintain a civilized uh, Well, society. isn't that what they call the anthropomorphic uh, principle? Is that, is that what? I think you're right. I so, think that's so it's the, the universe exists and we're in it because the universe exists and we're in it. And it's the only possibility. The only possibility for us to exist is the fact that the universe has the constants arranged in such a way that it allowed matter to exist in, in, in the uh, right amount so that like, you know, it wasn't destroyed by antimatter and, you know, and there was, you know, this much more, you know, proportionately and on and on and on and on. And then you can even get into like fine constant. It's the fine-tuned universe that yeah. if, the, if the attraction of the electron or the mass of the electron was just slightly different, uh, atoms wouldn't hold together. Right. Uh, matter would be impossible. So, so that's on the, the atomic level. But then later, you know, people will try to like, and I, I'll give this astronomy lecture. Well, I used to when it met. Uh, once a month at the observatory. And and so we would get cosmologists in there and we would get like, you know, theoretical physicists. We get people that ask these, you know, we're and, and the audience designed for non-physics, non-astronomers, non-scientists like me. And and just, you know, and we but people that think and you know ask these questions. So so they would say things like, you know, about the Goliath zone and you know and Earth and all this sort of thing. But what's interesting is that I, you know, the fact that the Earth is two thirds of the way out from the center of the galaxy. So the radiation isn't, you know, uh, as severe and we're around long enough to, for life to develop and not be bombarded by, you know, random events, blah, 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 cosmic rays or not cosmic rays, um, gamma ray bursts, things of that nature. So, mm -hmm. so that's, so all that's great. But then they talk about, they take it a little too far sometimes. So they'll say, well, earth is the only place where life can exist. Well, that is completely false. There are super earths out there. 
there are Many. planets that are slightly larger than Earth that would actually be better suited for this kind of biological life. I just read an article about that last week saying there, there's a there's a, a Earth like planet that's in an even more Goldilocks like zone. Right. So so I, I don't buy that. You know what I mean? So so I, I, I like I love the concept of the universe being tidy, but I, but it's not. And and the other thing that I find interesting is. In it to counter it, OK, as a counter argument to that. Whenever I want to really blow somebody's mind, I tell them that the Earth and the Moon system, right, in order for eclipses to occur and not occur every time, but to occur, I like set up a diagram. I show them about the shadow and everything, and I say, you know, there's no reason why the Moon has to be exactly as far away from the Earth as it is right now in time. In fact, it's moving further away. So. How does that happen, right? Why is it that just happens to be right now while human beings are on this planet that, and that is people like, they're like, what? You know, and that that's like almost religion, you know, because it's like, it's, it's just a fascinating coincidence, but it's so fascinating, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what blow people's mind, ask them, ask them, why is it that the same side of the moon always faces the earth? Why, why would that? Tidally happen? locked, right? It's tightly locked. That is the answer. But most people don't know that. And even I didn't know that until not that long ago. So, I mean, that's something that in Earth space science from eighth grade, they never covered that. Well, I mean, that's the whole concept of the dark side of the moon. We'll tie it back into Pink Floyd. I mean, there is no dark side of the moon. It's the side that we never see it, but it's not dark. It gets light there, you know, like it's not like eternally Absolutely. dark. Not so at all. You it's know? just as light as the side that we see. Yes, it's 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 perception. It's perception. All right. Well, I don't think we have time to like go into Apollo. I know you're a big Apollo fan, but uh, yeah. You, I, I mean, we can if you want to touch on that. No, no it's that's all right. I mean, it's something that fascinates me. I will just say, uh, here's my short story. Uh, alive during the moon landings, as you were, too young to be cognizant of them. Yeah. And what kicked off my lifelong fascination with it was, uh, I remember I was in a sixth grade science class. I think we were watching a film strip, if you remember those. I do. And the narrator casually tossed out the line, the moon landings, plural. I was probably 12 or 13 at the time. Up to that point, it had always been described my entire life as the moon landing, the moon landing. You know about the moon landing. We all know about the moon landing. And my brain said, what? There was more than one? I immediately went to the school library to discover that there had been six. My mind was blown. Six moon landings, tell me more. And that kicked off my, my lifelong uh, interest in, in that particular topic. Well, I know you said that if there was one place you could go, that might that one might be a, you know. A I would, uh, yeah, if I could. Uh, so this isn't a time travel thing, this is right. a, if I could locate myself uh, in teleport, I think it'd be fascinating to go visit the descent stage of, uh, of uh, Eagle um, in Tranquility Base. Check it out, up close. Uh, fascinating, but uh, I would be prohibited from doing so by US law, which has declared all of the Apollo landing sites as uh, national monuments not to be disturbed. So when we do return to the moon, somebody will eventually, uh, off limits. It's not far away. It's not, it's three days, three days. Anybody can make that trip. I can make that trip. Just that's like a home. Disney cruise. Absolutely, absolutely. You're not, you're not so far away. If you get in trouble, it's not so far back. Right, yep, I agree. I know, all this talk about Mars is just amazing to me. I love the, I love the high ideal of it. Yeah. Um, I, I, find, I, I have some very close friends who are really into it. One, um, person I interviewed for this this show actually she actually went out into the Utah desert and spent two weeks like acting like she was on Mars spacesuits eating food out of tubes that kind of stuff and uh she got there she broke her uh she broke a bone in her arm like like yeah. as soon as she got there and I'm like oh my god you have the right stuff she was like Jaeger with the broomstick handle like you know, like yeah it really you got a stick of beamings she stuck it out for two weeks. That's hardcore. 
injured. I'm like, wow, you have what it takes then because he, he does. I would have been yeah. like, take me to a hospital. <laughs> well, so, did, did you read The Martian or see the movie? No. Matt Damon. Okay, great book. Recommend it. Um, it's basically a series of, of perils. You know, first he has to find a way to shelter himself. Uh, his spacesuit is leaking. Then he has to find a way not to starve to death, and on and on and on. Uh, eventually, he has to make it back to the to the lander to get back into orbit to rendezvous with the rescue ship. Um, and all the way through, in the movie, they cut out a lot of the perils simply because two hours was not enough. Yeah. In the book, I was constantly thinking, "Oh, this next hurdle, I would give up. I would just give up. I would die. I would give up. I couldn't do it. I mean, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have the pluck. I wouldn't have the moxie." to keep going. I would just say, well, I tried really hard and I, I'm exhausted. I can't go on. I wonder how much of that was based on personal experience. I've heard that author interviewed and uh, he said that, you know, he, he's very grateful too. He's, he said he's extremely lucky that anybody read his book. He couldn't believe that like the success that he's had. Grateful. But when he talks about writing, he said the book before The Martian, he worked on for a year and he had to throw it out because mm -hmm. it was terrible. Sure. He said, imagine that. Imagine trying to, <clears throat> you, you've dedicated a year of your life and time to a project and you realize at the end of that, it's just horrible and unsalvageable and you have yep. to throw it out. Yep. Uh, that's, that's amazing. I how can't. Yeah, how I, do you keep going after that? I have no idea. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how you do that. I think you find another line of work. But his story is very common. I mean, so many authors have talked about that exact same, and sometimes more than a year is lost. You know? Wow. Uh, that's yeah. tough. It, it, it's, a, it's a special type of person to, uh, to be an artist who can persevere through that. Um, Maybe that's one of the reasons I do multiple disciplines so that I have that cushion. So that like, I, if, if, if I have a catastrophic fail in one category, I could say, well, at least I'll go make some pottery. You know, or, well, I'll well, go paint. I, you know. Well, that makes you a renaissance man. Um, it's, it's good to have diverse and varied interests. Um, not only does it make you more interesting during podcasts, kind of like this is a podcast, but a, a, a video that we're making like this, but uh, dinners are more interesting with people like that. I got to go back and check. Oh, here was the other one I was going to do if I was going to time travel. Yeah, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you like to go and be in the audience at a, Link, a Lincoln Douglas debate? Maybe. 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 Why, why, why don't you immediately jump at that? I, because I thought you would. This is this is gonna sound. Um, I should. I probably shouldn't even say this, but but I will. Um, the because <laughs> we can edit it out if I don't like what, the way sure. it comes. Out. You can. I, I think the more history I've read, the more unreliable it becomes. I don't know what to believe anymore. I, mm. I've read so much history mm -hmm. that I've read uh, that have what I consider to be glaring inaccuracies um, mm -hmm. that I don't know what's true anymore. I don't know if the rhetoric of the Lincoln-Douglas debates actually happened. I don't know if it was overblown, if it was written by reporters later to seem better than it was, if it was written by, you know what I mean? I, I just don't know. It's like reading um, uh, Livy and then reading about how right before the battle, Hannibal gave a speech to his entire army of 65,000 men. Physically impossible. Impossible, impossible. Probably never happened. Maybe he said a couple words to his lieutenants, generals, uh, to spread the word. But this is a tradition that this happens before ancient battles. And this has been hotly debated. Has this ever happened? You know, um, I can sort of believe that Julius Caesar like stood up and like rallied his men uh, mm -hmm. because he presented himself as a man of the people, as a soldier, so, uh, general, as, mm -hmm. you know, I will eat what they eat. I will sleep in the same tents. I will, you know, I will, I will um, uh, deprive myself of the luxuries if my men cannot have them kind of morale thing, mm -hmm. but that's an act as well. And he wrote his own commentaries. So we don't know. Yeah, that's unreliable. Written by him. It was all propaganda. Yeah. Right. So Any I autobiography is. 
I don't know. I mean, yeah. Okay. So yeah, I guess the answer to your question is yes. I'd like to go back and see what the veracity of the situation actually was. Right. Yeah. So that, 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 why, the bigger, the bigger issue that you're getting at is uh, I totally agree with you. If you read a lot of history, this eventually occurs to you that it is impossible to know history uh, beyond the broad events, you know, event happened on this date. Okay, that's indisputable. Event happened on this date. You really can't fake that. But in terms of how did society react to politicians' policy? How did they feel about what was happening contemporaneously? Um, and, and authors write history. Modern, modern authors write this and they footnote it. But they're footnoting another book that footnoted another book. And the farther away you get from the original source, it becomes diluted, modified, changed. Um, and then, of course, history it, the, the history is determined by the person who's writing the history. Uh, the old saying that history is written by the victors if, in, in the case of war. Sure. Um, Curtis LeMay said that if America had lost the war, that um, he would have been prosecuted as a war criminal for, for the firebombing that he conducted. Um, what a different story that would have been if, if the war had gone in a different direction. Who would have been put on trial for what crimes? Um, so all these things are very loose and, in, and uh, uh, subject to gross interpretation, uh, latitudes of interpretation. So I completely get what you're saying that um, it's impossible to know. I mean, it's more possible now because history is chronicled in such finer detail as you get closer to the, to the current moment. But when you start getting back more than a hundred years, although I will say that, that in American, the American history that I've read, you know, say around the time of the founders, um, you always have the source truth of things like letters that Jefferson and, uh, and, um, Hamilton? Second, not Hamilton. Um, oh, Adams. Adams, Adams, thank you. Jefferson and Adams wrote to each other. Uh, so those are penned in their own hands. We know that. Um, they're talking about what they were thinking at that moment. Right. Uh, that's, that is as true as a letter can be true. Right. Um, but it's, it's a really interesting question. Well, uh, I it, mean... It's like the historical version of the questions we were talking about before about physical reality, that there are certain aspects of physical reality that are unknowable. There, there are many, many, many aspects of history that are totally unknown. Well, I agree. And, and I said, you know, I th or actually, I think it was Thucydides. Thucydides was actually there, like fighting in the Peloponnesian War. He wrote about battles that he participated in. Yeah. And even he couldn't tell you exactly what happened everywhere on the battlefield that he was on. Impossible. Because how could you, right? He, he was experiencing the fog of war himself. Exactly. So it's like, uh, you know, how can you, how can you possibly, you know, you're in a, you're in a phalanx, right? You can only see, and thank goodness, you can only see this much because that's about all you can control. So you don't even want to know what's going on around you because there are way too many dangers for your little mind to deal with. Just stab that guy in front of you. Just keep underneath your part, your partner's shield. Make sure the next guy's under your shield. Hold tight, don't run away, don't fall down, just do that, right? And uh, I mean, what a terrifying experience that must have been. You know, what a claustrophobic, hot, miserable, terrifying experience that must have been. And to survive it must have been amazing. You know, like, look at what we did, you know? We beat the Persians back, you know? I mean, that's Marathon, but not, this, not uh, the Peloponnesian War. But yeah, and it's like, are, are you, are you, you know, he, he, I may, I argued a point with him. He pounded his fist on the bar and he said, no, that's not right. This is history. Like he saw it on the history channel and therefore that made it true. Right. I couldn't uh, believe so myself. That, that's, that's, I, a, I that's, believe an, that's an issue with media literacy and, and getting into the ideas of who writes history and from how many, from what perspective and how many perspectives are there? With almost anything, there's, there's a vast array of perspectives. I've re I recently read a, a history book. Uh, oh, it's all inclusive of the uh, entire history of the United States. 700 pages long. It's, even that's not long enough to really get in all the details. But right. you, get, you get the general gist of all the important themes. 
And the, the third, last third of the book is mostly about the 20th century. And, and a lot of it is about the period of history that I, you and I have lived through. And things that were happening when we were kids, we, we didn't know uh, because we weren't politically aware. Um, but the eye-opening thing for me that is, is provides some kind of consolation. There's always a feeling that this moment that we're living through now, it's unlike any other, it's worse than it's ever been. The, the consoling aspect generally about history is that you recognize there's nothing new under the sun. It has happened before with different names, uh, different themes, but the same general gist. And this That's is why this is why this is why people are so drawn to ancient Rome. Yes, because everything you ever want to know about human beings govern themselves is encapsulated in Rome. Right? I'm yes. not even I'm not a, I'm not a Roman scholar by any means, but I know that much that I, I could I could take any situation going on today in any country in the world and find an analog in Roman history. Pretty much. Pretty much. Because human, motiv human motivations don't change. The only thing that changes is technology. I the think human beings relate to each other and the, the means by which they want to uh, attain power and exert control are timeless. It gives me great satisfaction when I read something from Seneca or I read something and it's exactly what I was like, describes the situation I'm in, you know, right now. We were talking earlier about time travel and I was thinking of a Seneca quote where he says, you know, most people are very possessive of their things, he said, but they're very uh, lax with the one thing that they have the least of, which is time. You know, when we were talking about unstructured time and it's like, you know, they knew life was short, you know, they understood that. There was like, he used to, he has another quote where he says, live immediately. I've put that on a piece of pottery. It's just, it's wonderful words. And it's a guy that lived, 2000 years ago, who's like, the I human experience is the uh, same, right? Yes, yes. The, well, and, and the, the knowledge that we will die is what makes us unique amongst all animals on the planet. Well, here's the funny thing about, we, we were talking about like raging against the clouds, right? So um, whenever somebody starts doing the kids get off my lawn thing, like Tara will come home and she say, oh, these kids, you know, today. I mean, she's a wonderful teacher, but every teacher gets that moment where they're like, Absolutely. there were too I'm many sure. kids and these teenagers, blah, 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 blah. So I always like look up this quote and I'm reading. I, I admit that I don't have this memorized, but it's um, the quote is, I see no hope for the future of our people if they are dependent on frivolous youth of today. For certainly all youth are reckless beyond words. When I was young, we were taught to be discreet and respectful of elders, but the present youth are exceedingly wise, disrespectful, and impatient of restraint. And that was written by Hesiod in the eighth century BC. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So it, it makes me, it reminds me of the, uh, uh, every time a generation says, this is it, it's, uh, this new technology is, will be our downfall. It was originally books, right? Because the, printed word would destroy the need to memorize, which is how stories had been translated or, or passed down for centuries. Right. So without, without the need to have a strong memory, we're lost. We're lost. It's the end. <laughs> and I always love when people say like, how did they memorize the, um, the uh, Iliad, the Odyssey? How did they know Homer before there was writing? How could that possibly be? How was there an oral tradition? I'm like, do you remember the lyrics to Smoke on the Water? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, well, they set it to song and they used music as a memory aid. I mean, if you can remember a song that you heard when you were five years old, you know, or 12 years old, why, why can't they have learned like a lyric poem that they would sing to each other? You know, it makes perfect this sense. This is a realization that I had uh, in a museum just a few years ago. Uh, it was the museum, it was a design museum, and there was a room dedicated to architectural models. And they were uh, made of wood. Uh, most of them were Italian for whatever reason. And uh, they were tended to be cathedrals. And they would be these elaborate cross sections. Uh, and you know how complicated cathedrals are. I mean, incredibly complicated. Uh, and these models were so finely done. All these tiny structures and the mathematics behind it. 
And you'd look at it and you'd think, surely this, this is something that could only be made with a 3D printer. Um, but no, handcrafted, not, not, only, not only handcrafted for the model, but the, uh, the architect who uh, did the math to work it all out, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, mind boggling to me as a, as a 21st century human being to look at this and think, well, my God, how did they do it? The youth of today, I think for them, it's, it's incomprehensible that any great thing was ever attained without the aid of a computer. Well, you didn't have computers back then. My God, how did you do anything? And the, the, the thing that, that that exhibit of architectural models reminded me of that was so impressive was that it doesn't matter what the time period is or what the technology is available to us at that time, the human mind has always been extraordinarily clever. We will do the most outrageous things with whatever happens to be available to us at that moment. There's nothing unique about how smart we are now. It's just that we're, we're building on that mountain that's behind us and it gets higher all the time. We're, we've always been this clever. Better tools. That's it. Better oh, tools right. and a bigger, a bigger book of accumulated wisdom. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, like that TV series that I turned you on to, Art of the Western World. I think he starts it out. One of the very first lines he says is, we're all Greeks, right? I think yes. he quotes like Byron or, or it's either Shelley or Byron he quotes, but it's like, and it's true. We built upon that scientific, um, try, the trying to understand the universe in a scientific way, the world around us. And, and the Greeks really did that, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, Right. They were, they were the first. They were the first to. Um, well, should we say they were the first? I wouldn't uh, say the first, but they had the Egyptians into account. They had a unique way. They had a. They had a unique way of separating the the um, divinity, and just looking at the earthly, their earthly surroundings. Well, those two things weren't uh, were not in conflict. It was no. not. It was not forbidden to question. How are these things put together? Right. For fear that the gods would strike you down. Uh, no, but but in the monotheistic, not the monotheistic, in the uh, monarchies of of the um, the ancient Near East, like in you know Ptolemy, I mean not Ptolemaic, um, in ancient Egypt, the Pharaonic Egypt is what I'm going for, and in like the um, the Persian Empire, where you have like one great king, you know, who who controls a vast swath of land and the bureaucracy behind it. Um, you know, that's, that's a, that develops a certain culture of thinking, but the Greeks were these little frogs around a pond, right? That, you know, they were, they were all like these independent little states that had their own little cultures and, and they considered themselves, um, they identified with each other as a, a people, but they still had their, in, the independent spirit of thought in each of those little like areas. And I think that like laboratory, if for lack of a better word, um, allowed ideas to proliferate at a greater rate than say uh, the Persian empire, you know, would, would do it. You know, they would have the muscle mass to get behind an idea, but did they have a proliferation of ideas? The Greeks had that proliferation of ideas and were willing to experiment with it, you know, I think. 